Good afternoon and warm greetings on the behalf of Team India First. India First, as you know, is a public discussion forum. It is com now completing around 19 months in the time. The, the forum was started because a need was felt that the public discourse in JNU is losing its sharp intellectual edge and is going down the road of empty political rhetoric. When the forum was started, there were doubts expressed by many people about the viability of such a forum in a campus, especially with such a name and a forum which is independent and which is based on voluntary participation. But we are happy to say that we have been proven wrong. Even though we had our moments of doubts before several talks whether people would turn up for this kind of topic or not. So today we are going to discuss a very important topic, a very relevant topic, which is the food, energy, and water, and the nexus between them, and how this nexus shapes and reshapes the society. Now being in JNU, this is not a new topic for us. This is a very familiar topic, because we always talk about Jal Jangal and Jameen. We always talk about uh, models of economic growth. We talk more about what, what are the flaws in those models of economic growth. But this talk is going to be a bit different from the usual JNU talks. Because in JNU, there are three trajectories which people follow when, we, when they discuss this kind of topic. One is which blames America, imperialism, and capitalism, not to mention the Jews for every problem which we have. The second one, which goes immediately goes back to 5,000 years of history, to explain the problems which, which we are facing today, which are in fact very important problems. So according to them, we do not have water in our taps because Manu Smriti says so, that you should not have water in your tap. And there's a third view which, there's a third section which goes on to join the Aam Aadmi Party, thinking that a non-corrupt government can solve the problem of energy and resources simply by issuing an executive order which will reduce the prices by 50%. So today we have Saurabh Jha, who is an analyst of defense and energy issues, who is a columnist in various national and international magazines, and who's also an author whose critically acclaimed book, The Upside Down Book of Nuclear, Nuclear Energy, deals with the nuclear energy scenario in India. His next book, The Nexus, is coming out next year, which deals with the very topic which we are going to discuss today. So I request Sarabh Jha, please continue the discussion. Thank you, Abhinav. Uh, thanks to India for uh, having me here. Uh, Abhinav, of course, talked about how the shibboleths of the past or, you know, or mere governance is not going to fix the nexus between energy, food, and water. Although I might take a few shots at America and capitalism, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> that, so now the thing is that you know, this, uh, I'll just give a brief background. Uh, I came to this idea. Uh, I understood how this idea shapes our modern world. When I traveled through India, backpacked through India with uh, Deva Priya, I backpacked over 16,000 kilometers on local buses on a, on a budget of only 500 rupees a day for bed and board. That is when, you know, the, the centrality of energy, food, and water hit me. And how energy, food, and water, how the energy, food, and water economies, how the energy, food, and water sectors are completely uh, intertwined with each other. And they are become, and that, you know, the linkage is becoming reinforced over time. So, so see, it's like this. Of all the things that we do, what is most important to us? I won't say happiness or anything of that sort, because we are talking about, you know, we are talking about the material economy here, about, say, man as an animal. The fact is that if you do not have, you know, food for a few weeks, if you do not have water for a few days, or if you don't have clean air for a few minutes, each of these things is likely to, you know, take away your life. You're not going to be able to exist, not, I'm not even talking about subsist, you're not going to be able to exist without these three things. So these are central to our very existence. As a as man, as an animal needs these three things more than anything else. Mankind, humankind, humankind, everybody. Now, the point is that these are the three very basic things that you buy before you buy anything else. When you make your, as a consumer, when you make your, uh, you know, your budgetary choices and decisions, make your, uh, you know, your budgetary choices and decisions, 
you actually buy energy, food and water before you buy anything else. It's only after you net out the cost of energy, food and water, and if you have disposable income left over that you buy anything else. You know, that is where your so-called purchasing power comes from. If you're in the middle classes, that is supposed to be substantial enough for you to buy white goods, you know, cars, or even pay for home loans. That is the idea. That is the whole concept of development that we are in at the moment. Now, the, but the point, point is that, you know, a lot of people don't understand that these were things that you did not actually have to pay for at one time. You know, when, when we used to live in a more rural economy, yes, there, were, there was a huge time cost involved, no doubt about it. Which, is, which also meant that you did not have time to do other things, you know, innovate or whatever else. But the fact is that you could draw water from a nearby well or a nearby pond. You could, you grew your own food. Maybe you did not get areca nuts from Brazil, but you know, but you could at least grow radishes in your backyard. And you also had control over your energy supply because your energy needs were minimum. You used to hew wood. That also had time costs. And time is supposed to be the ultimate investment in you know most dynamics but still so you had those costs but so so the so you know the modern world will say yes i have saved your time in this in this new setup where in the urbanized setup utilities deliver these services to you and they are, there's a, there are these large networks which actually get you your energy food water but you know studies have shown that how housewives in america continue to spend more time on household chores than they did in 1912. You know, we don't actually, in the real sense, we have not really moved away from energy, food and water. We still revolve around getting these first. We have to invest a lot of time and money in getting at least that basic subsistence level of income that can buy us these three things. And even then, you know, it's not as if everybody's going to buy that. Many people in an urbanized setup are highly indebted. In the West, they are even more indebted. In the West, even governments are indebted. Our, our, if our uh, current, if you are at 55% of uh, GDP, our public debt figure at the moment, in the West, it is already over 100% so most of that economy. And it's actually considerably higher because uh, a lot of that debt is just being turned over using the private sector. So, but how did we get here? See, the reason for that is very simple. It's like this. You were, you have a river basin. Where are civilizations? Civilizations are invariably located on river basins or oases, you know, catchment areas basically, lagoons. That's where you have civilizations, where there is access to fresh water, right? So, and there you start with say agriculture. You move from the hunter-gatherer phase and you became an agriculturalist, etc. Then over time you develop simple manufacturers, manufacturers which did not need that kind of scale. But then this whole industrial revolution took hold of the world in say 1750 or in England first. And it's not surprising that it took place in England actually. If you think of it, England was a, was a very likely candidate for the industrial, this, uh, this kind of industrial revolution to begin. Because it's like this. Uh, at that time, India and China used to account for almost 50% of the world's GDP, right? They had this sustainable manufacturing sector in the form of uh, textiles, okay, which, you, which used to uh, depend on handloom and on low energy techniques and other things. And you also had other sustainable uh, industrial activities, you know, those medieval kind of industrial activities. What was England doing at that time? England was in the England had just come out of the Cromwellian Revolution. See, England also had a revolution. It's, it's just another matter. It's not talked about like a French Revolution, but much before the French Revolution, there was a revolution in America when Oliver Cromwell uh, threw out the monarchy and he became Lord Administrator and all that. Anyway, but that was short-lived and the monarchy was restored, but with different terms of you know reference. From there on, it was quite clear that England would be controlled by a capitalist class, okay, which, which, which finally expressed itself in the form of the East India Company. See, the East India Company happened due to a compact between England and uh, Scotland. You know, James VI of England, uh, Scotland became James I of England. And it was after that that the East India Company made its charter and everything. So anyway, so the point is, what I'm saying is that, you know, 
what what was happening then is the English aristocracy and the the big capitalist class was getting rich on trade, only on trade. They were re-exporting calicos from India and other parts of the East to uh, you know to uh, parts of Europe and even to Africa because at that time there were civilizations in Northern Africa with whom they used to trade. They used to get their slaves from West Africa, but Northern Africa had you know uh, Islamic uh, civilizations. So now what happened was, they found that they were not going to be able to break through with this kind of a model. They were accumulating a lot of capital, because trade. There's nothing better than trade, you know. If if you have a if you have a trading model where you can get things at cost and you can sell them at a profit, there's nothing better than that for capital accumulation. So that is the model that the English aristocracy and the big capitalists had. What they decided was, with that money, with the capital they grew, they invested that hugely into the thermodynamic cycle, into understanding the thermodynamic cycle, and they could do that because at that time, in in the early you know 18th centuries, early 17th and 18th century, sea coal deposits were found all over England. All over England, you had sea coal deposits. You know, right at the ground level in Manchester, you had coal. Low, low, uh, low ash content coal and the high ash content coal also, both of those. You know, so you had you had you had coal right at the ground level, and at that time what happened was uh, getting wooden uh, utensils and all was becoming difficult in England because the population was increasing because that trade was helping them buy food from overseas. You know they had repealed the corn laws and they were getting food from overseas and stuff like that. So they started using that. Sea coal, those easily available energy to start experimenting with the thermodynamic cycle, and which was the first industry that took root over there. It was basically metallurgy, metallurgical industries for utensils, for utensils. So you had this sort of a, you had these villages and you had a small town, and typically there would be a workshop in that small town on the outskirts or near the villages, things like that. Nothing that required huge scale. That is how they started. And let's not forget, we are talking about a very cold country here. So heat, process heat is very important for such a country. So it is not very surprising that they will focus their, you know, their energies on getting that, uh, getting that uh, solved. Whereas we lived in a tropical country, although we were a, you know, superpower in metallurgy two thousand years ago. We had uh, synthesized wood steel before anybody else, which has carbon nanotube structures, things like that. But over time, in the medieval era, we were faltering. In our ability to, uh, you know, uh, invent things based on the thermodynamic cycle or anything else, but England was a world leader. So England came up with processes that helped them substitute labor. Apparently, it didn't really substitute labor because the the elasticity or the elasticity of substitution was not that high between capital and labor. Labor was very much required. Then there was there was a question of specific inputs and things like that. So they came up with the arc right wheel, the spinning jenny, these things. But even then, they could not beat Indian calicos that many years ago. They imposed huge tariffs okay, on Indian calicos in the beginning, in around 1780 or the tariffs on Indian calicos were 300 percent. And even by 1890, when they had apparently taken care of India, you know, they were ruling India. Even then, they used to impose. Uh, uh, you know, tariffs as high as 87%, 90%. This is all there in, I think, Paul Theroux's work, he covers all this. But So, the bottom line was, even despite all that, they could not compete with the textile sector in India. And that is one of the reasons why we are still around, because they could not destroy our textile sector fully. Although they tried. They destroyed the handicraft sector, they destroyed many other sectors also. More importantly, they destroyed agriculture. Which is why we had decadent famines. Now, what I'm coming to is that this this is all. So this process that was undertaken did not really yield industrial uh, might of the sort that it is projected to give. It did not yield comparative advantage. But what it yielded was military capability. Okay, this this uh, their their adoption of the thermodynamic cycle, their understanding of the thermodynamic cycle. Their understanding of you know the laws of nature that govern physics and chemistry and etc. basically helped them to become militarily powerful. And they became militarily powerful and they imposed a trading system whereby they would keep your markets open, keep their markets guarded, 
and they would draw your resources because they won't they don't didn't have enough resources to scale up production they had coal but they didn't, they, you need other resources what is the main resource that you need the main resource that you need is actually fresh water that is the main resource you need more than anything else for industrialization when you talk about you know uh, industrial development industrial growth etc you're basically talking about green fields it is in the green field that you set up industry you do not set up industry on in the middle of the desert which is why when all these discussions come up about why singur why not junjunu district in rajasthan junjunu district in rajasthan simply does not have the environment to set up industry it is where your where you multi crop that is the best place to set up industry if it is close to a port there is nothing better than that that is why you would want to set up industry over there but that would mean that you take away the green field which was growing rice earlier and that actually has an irreversible element to it you know green fields giving away to an industrial unit means that that unit cannot go back to agriculture industrial units do not return to agriculture the only thing that takes the place of an old decaying industrial unit is real estate that is the only thing that takes the place of an old decaying industrial unit so the process is actually like this you have green fields you have some people coming up with some people with historic capital and other things who come up with a new idea maybe they they technology has caught up or maybe they have directed technology in that way as in the case of england and you set up something but you will set up set it up on the side of an old field a corn field a wheat field a rice field and you will use because initially the you don't have to train labor that much you will use surplus labor from the farm in your factory now what will then happen is over time people will settle around the factory okay it's the workers will settle in their own humble colonies and you know the management of the unit will buy land around the factory also this is this can be observed anywhere it has happened in delhi bombay calcutta everywhere in fact calcutta is a great example of a post industrial town in many ways so then what happens is you do that but slowly the logistics of that place does not work anymore there are many hundreds of other reasons why a industrial unit has a shelf life you know an industrial you very few industrial units last for 200 years most of them don't last for more than 40 or 50 years after which they become uneconomical you know to operate or run and one of the main reasons is because the logistics doesn't work anymore a prime example of this is the hindustan motor factory in uh, you know in uh, uttar pradesh which shut down just uh, this year the reason why is because the whole place has got urbanized yes there is a railway siding over there but even then the the just doesn't work and not to mention in an urbanized setting where energy food water are no longer under your control you will want uh, more income a laborer will constantly demand higher wages because the cost of living is rising so if the cost of living is rising the laborer is demanding higher wages the logistics is not working then that industrial unit will get choked out over time as it is it will it can't be upgraded infinitely there are new projects coming up there are new products which are coming up like for instance usha comp usha's many units shut down because they used to produce these sewing machines which just have no use anymore you know no market at all So that kind of thing also happens. Now, now what happens is now you the, now that you have this urban agglomeration around the unit, the only thing that you can do with the unit is build a nice big, you know, Hira Nandani kind of uh, condo over there. That is all that you can do over there, and that is what it takes. Uh, that is what takes place. And but when does it takes place? Take place when the cost of real estate has risen sufficiently to cover the cost of remediating that area. because you see when you have done some industrial uh, you uh, you build a unit somewhere you basically polluted the ground ground water over there where is the where is the water even for the apartment going to come from so they have to remediate the area in many places it has not been done properly as we know but it's all right so so when so essentially it is the green field where you have agriculture it is the green field where you have uh, industry and it is the green field where you have services now no longer a green field now what has happened is because uh, because uh, over time your industrial sector has also become more and more capital intensive and automated basically using more energy rather than labor right what you you just don't generate that much employment anymore from industrialization especially the older industries which are mature now 
like steel, automobile, things like that. These are highly automated. You can run a steel plant with uh, four shifts of 200 people each. And I'm talking about a big integrated steel plant. That's the level of automation. But that the big steel plant continues to use a huge amount of land area to uh, situate itself. Right. So, so the thing is, that, that is why you have so much resistance. Why would somebody say, why isn't, why aren't the people in Kalinda Nagar just selling their land? Why don't they just sell it for, uh, the government is uh, telling them we'll give you 20 lakhs an acre. Why don't you just sell it? The point is, after they sell the land, what are they going to do? Earlier, when, when the employment intensity of units used to be far higher, they could always get something to do with the unit or with the ancillaries or etc. Now, those are highly skilled jobs which are limited. They don't know what they're going to do there, which is why the resistance. So, the, so political economy in India and many other parts of the world then went to the second uh, rung of so-called development, which is called urbanization. So you see, when that industrial unit, when a condo grew up on that industrial unit, some of the blue collar, uh, some of the blue collar staff who were lost from the, who lost their employment, initial employment, they could be absorbed in building the apartment. And in fact, that happens in many places because uh, they saw some, you know, there are uh, in a in a steel factory, you always have electricians and plumbers, etc. You can use that in an apartment building complex also. So that is how you absorb some of the slack over there. And you also sold this as an election electoral plank because the employment elasticity of services continues to be better than that of, uh, is much better than that of industry at the moment, uh, real estate in the businesses. So you sold this dream of, you know, this unchecked urbanization where the city will just grow outward, even without the old process where you first had a industrial unit and things like that. Now you just build condos anywhere. Like you look at Delhi over here. This is a gigantic urban sprawl. You have a situation where there are huge buildings with empty uh, with empty apartments, which are selling for prices which are far far higher than the uh, than the uh, than the annual income of many middle class families. Okay, you have empty high rises and you have people living on the streets. This is the kind of mismatch that you are creating in an economy, and this is not your economy. This is everybody's economy. But this process was patented in the West. This is where this process was first patented, this particular kind of process. Why? It's like this. So now that you have that industrial unit being choked out of, uh, you know, choked out of uh, business, you're going to have a slack in employment. Some of your urban services have grown, you know, somebody's hotel opened small retail, etc., things like that. But mostly you have, you will find a slack in employment after your initial process of uh, urban, you know, industrialization and then urbanization. So initially you tell people that we will all become hired in the services sector. If you look at the Western economy, the 85% of their employment is in the services sector, with agriculture accounting for only 2% or even less. In the case of Poland, that is not the case. Poland still has a big rural sector, but most of the Western economies are like that. But you see, services is a very funny thing. You must produce, you must add value to something that you can service. If you are not producing anything in your economy, then the only thing you are servicing must be things which are coming from outside. Right? They, you, because you, you have to service something, right? If you have, if you have somebody in a, who's servicing your Kelvinator, then you bought a Kelvinator and somebody's built that Kelvinator. So that was also the model that GE and all took in the initial year. They moved their uh, units to China and other places, and they were and they hired a lot of people in just marketing and sales. But that doesn't go on forever because those jobs can be bartered away even easier. All the jobs that grew out of the great IT revolution are being bartered away rapidly. See, first they outsourced all the industries to the uh, to the East Asian countries. And then they outsourced all the services to us, right? We had Bangalore and other places. I'll come to that in a bit. So, so then, what, what is going to happen to employment in the Western economies? There is not going. There is not going to be enough employment. It's obvious, and the numbers are there. Today, Spain is a country where youth unemployment has crossed sixty percent. This is not an economy that is functioning anymore. It is, there is no point of talking about rich and poor. If your economy has 60% unemployment in, in the youth category, it means it has zero purchasing power, essentially. Nobody is going to invest in such an economy and nobody can. Now, why they can't? The reason for that is simple. You have already urbanized the entire river basin. 
you have no green fields left where is the option value of land that you are going to invest anything you talk about somebody talks about myanmar having a green field advantage obviously myanmar has green fields bengal has green fields bihar has green fields these places have green field advantage because they actually have green fields you know you you punjab doesn't have a green field advantage punjab land is poisoned using chemical farming techniques so you know so where are you going to invest it's not just a question of uh saying that i want to i'm going to kick start my economy it's a question of who's going to invest in your economy and your government can't invest in economies because the american government is completely broke it's 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 accumulated debt is over 17 trillion dollars now and it's only through uh, you know debt restructuring programs and turnover that it's going on otherwise they won't be able to pay salaries to us government employees yet the entire rhetoric the world over is of rich country and poor country okay rich country and poor country this is the rhetoric the rhetoric is not about rich country and poor country the real rhetoric should be about country that survives and country that collapses this is all that matters we must remember that civilizations do not thrive civilization survive coming back to the 5000 year story he gave indian civilization and chinese civilization that for and and till uh, till nasser egyptian civilization had sustained for 5000 years they had gone through many ups and downs but they at least they had sustained now with this process that began in england in 1750 there is a very real chance of civilizational collapse everywhere this is people are not understanding this you are you are vacuuming up like this in the name of development but you are basically hollowing yourself out so you are going to fall you're not building any foundation for development because you are ignoring the nexus between energy food and water and what is this nexus the nexus is very simple every time you drive a drive your car or you go to the filling station you basically increase the cost of your food by an infinitesimal amount why do you do that very simple your entire food economy is dependent on hydrocarbons now okay when you when you increase when the cost of oil or when the cost of gas increases the cost to the fertilizer company increases immediately because fertilizers are made chemical fertilizers are made using naphtha and you know natural gas as feedstock either of these most are now most of the now many are moving to natural gas also because of this urban sprawl model that you have you are bringing food from further and further and further away Whereas it costs rupees six in Nasik for a kg of onion, it will cost you twenty rupees or thirty rupees over here. And it's not just a question of middlemen and fixing it and getting FDI and retail or something like that. None, nothing is going to take away the pure energy cost of transporting the onion. So it is going to show in the markup. Like a lot of people think, you know, we'll just import onions or we'll increase productivity. But if your input costs are increasing all the time, there is a flow rate at which onions will be sold. you will not be able to bring down the cost of onions simply by growing more onions suppose i suppose i you can you can hit some of the middlemen i don't deny that you can hit the middlemen but the basic cost of onion will not change because you don't have economies of scale in growing more onions now there are no economies of scale in fact there might be diseconomies of scale because of the energy uh, you know energy cost involved so so this is this is the link between your energy and food economy one is the one is the very cost of growing the food which is not only fertilizers also all the implements you use often in india you hear let us mechanize agriculture or it's going to increase productivity it's also going to increase your costs you must take into take that into account mechanization per se is not going to yield uh, uh, lead to lower food costs in your economy because it is ultimately contingent on energy same thing holds for you know using chemical fertilizers which is what we've done all the norman borlaug green revolution technique is that and these and the funny part is these high yielding varieties not only use chemical fertilizers they also require more energy and more water to grow and somebody will say let us use biotech you know let us use gmo and solve things see you must understand that gmo cannot violate the basic principles of the conservation of mass and energy Okay, if you are going to take something and it is going to yield more, it must have used something of else, something else also in more, right? You cannot have more output with less input of everything. That is a physical impossibility. You can't, you can't do that. You must have used something as output for that greater input as greater output. And typically, it has been found that GMO 
just like the high yielding varieties uses far more energy and water to basically yield the the problem with gmo is not terminated gene or they'll poison you or america will take control over your food supply and all that the poison is simple the problem is simply that it will not solve your food cost problem because it uses more energy and water to grow more to yield more you are looking at yield only in terms of per hectare yield you know per uh, yield per uh, unit of land if you look at a more consolidated composite index of what is what you consider yield you will find that gmos are not all that attractive at all they use more energy they use more water it's not like they use sunlight better or something of course they do that also but uh, you know not to the extent that you will solve your basic problem that is the problem of agriculture see agriculture also uses huge amounts of water especially thirsty crops like high yielding variety wheat and rice 90% of fresh water withdrawals in the state of uttar pradesh are by agriculture now if mulayam or modi or whoever may want to industrialize agriculture how are you going to do that without increasing water productivity in agriculture but then that also has other costs you can't increase water productivity just like that you need directed technical change you need to look at the again the composite index and everything so you cannot just talk in the air and talk about industrialization without looking at the nexus now let us look at uh, the nexus from the point of view of energy energy all forms of energy all forms of both delivered energy primary energy require water okay whether it be the trees that you cut the trees that you know people in the countryside still use because 19% of our uh, 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 of our fuel use still comes from hewing wood and everything the trees use water right if you look at a large power plant it uses a huge amount of water it i mean it requires uh, huge fresh water withdrawals which is why you are trying to site plants uh, you know along coastal ecosystems so that you can draw sea water that also has its own problem but still it's still something you can't do inland anymore and uh, somebody will say what about things like uh, concentrated solar power concentrated solar power actually needs twice the amount of water per megawatt hour you know or per, or per kilowatt hour uh, then uh, coal or nuclear so it's not like uh, you know you can build a solar thermal plant in the middle of the desert see even 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 thing you can build in the middle of the desert when extend although not really is maybe solar photovoltaics which is what modi is also doing modi is also building them on top of these canals you know uh, because he wants to prevent evaporation and things like that so so you had that you had that you have that energy energy sector requires a, ma a massive amount of water and energy sector obviously requires food because you need people to work the energy sector they are going to need food right the food economy uses both energy and water and the water economy uses a huge amount of both energy and food okay because uh, getting water to homesteads also involves people and getting water to homesteads involves a lot of energy you if you uh, just look at your pump cost bills nowadays and you will understand why is it that farmers agitate in so many parts of the world and especially in the northern states of india it's very simple they are not uh, agitating for electricity that is what times of india will die they are agitating for water they want what is called night power because the fields are irrigated at night and they want water they want ground water because they have the great canal system that the british built in the, in the northern regions and in places like baksar in bihar are a, are a complete failure you see canal systems these open canal systems are a very very bad idea these open canal systems lead to both a rapid uh, an unacceptable rate of evaporation as well as uh, sinkage of water this is what has happened all throughout the world in fact a lot of people talk about angkor wat and things like that they should also know that in front of angkor wat is a gigantic uh, you know ancient ruin of a city which was heavy on these canals it's all covered by forest now it had a population of 2 million now 1000 years ago and it was ruined because of its water policies its water policies was water management and water management meant you know obstructing the natural flow of the river and diverting water here and there for all sorts of purposes it had very advanced drainage but they obviously not advanced enough because they lost water at a rate that ultimately led to the collapse of the city itself so you know so so what these canals do is they basically take water away from where the water is supposed to be and don't really take it there efficiently 
So which is why you have drip irrigation and dry land farming and you have participation with the Israelis and all that because they are pioneers in that and all that is being talked about. But it has to be done far much more if you want to sustain agriculture here. So what you are doing with these canals is these canals ruined Egypt. Now I'm coming to the geostrategy part. How energy food water nexus has ruined Egypt. Okay. Example, Egypt. Egypt was also one of the great, uh, you know, socialist countries after World War II, which had gained independence. Well, not well. It was never really a British colony that way. But it was under uh, European domination as a protectorate and other things. It was a semi or semi-colony, if you like. But what happened was, Egypt decided to use the old path that all countries have used at some point or the other, which is large, multi-purpose hydropower projects. Okay. This is the path that everybody is used. The pioneer in this is again the United States of America with the Tennessee Valley Authority. The idea is very, it's brilliant. You will have a river. You will simply build a concrete embankment and a dam. You will dam it and you will move water from there for turning either turbines or to fields to industry and everything through a canal network. And uh, the real attraction of this thing lies in what is called energy return on energy invested. Okay, the energy payback period for a run of the river system, run of the river dam, which doesn't have a reservoir, but a run of the river dam is very good. It is the energy return on energy investment can be as high as one is two hundred. No, it can be as high as one is two hundred. So, which is which is the real attraction? Which is why all developmental processes start with investing in multi-purpose hydropower projects. So, Nehru was talking about the temples of India. Nasser was damming. The Soviets were building dams which are bigger than cities, you know. And America had the Hoover Dam before that in part of the Tennessee Valley Authority. So now what happened was, Nasser's people, after Nasser also, the Egyptians continued with the great Aswan Dam project. And the Aswan Dam project went into 18,000 miles of canals. The total canal network from the Aswan Dam is 18,000 miles, taking water from the Nile into the desert. Okay, in the great hope that uh, the Nile Valley, the delta, the delta of the Nile will become, uh, the pressure on the delta of the Nile will reduce and people will locate to new settlements in the desert because water is now available. Nothing of that sort happened because water was not really made available. Half the water was brackish, became brackish by the time it got there, it evaporated, all sorts of things happened. And farming did happen because of those canals. But you know what kind of farming? Large-scale industrial farming, growing strawberries in the middle of uh, Egypt. While Egypt can't feed itself with enough bread today, which it used to always, it grows exports strawberries. Okay, this is the state of affairs in Egypt. Now, what has happened is this dam, it has created a huge problem for the Nile. The Nile used to, you know, replenish itself. The Nile Delta used to... Uh, get, uh, what, what should I say, its fertility, the fertility of the Nile Delta has become impaired by the Aswan Dam. Earlier that annual flooding which used to cause so much, uh, so much misery at the mouth of the Nile was actually very good for the Nile Delta's fertility. Now that flood, uh, flooding doesn't happen and yields have completely stagnated in the Nile Delta. On top of that, there is now not enough water at the mouth of the Nile for all the offshore drilling projects that the Egyptians had. And, and onshore projects also. Because even oil and gas industry, oil and gas energy industry requires a lot of water. A huge amount of water for, for all kinds of things. Okay, So they don't have enough water at all. So they are not, unlike Saudi Arabia, they are not able to export enough oil and gas to buy everything from everybody. And they don't grow enough bread anymore. So if you look at the Tahari Square demonstrations, they have coincided with the cost of bread. But I don't want to do any kind of spurious correlation like maybe uh, the, that uh, free economics guy does. But it's not a coincidence that you had sharply rising costs of basic amenities that led up to the 2011 Tari Square demonstration and everything. Which was of course used by very effectively by the Americans. There's no doubt about that. Because that is a particular technology the Americans have been deploying ever since the internet became a worldwide phenomenon and social media occurred and everything. So that is the thing. So you can see that the nexus between, violating the nexus between energy, food and water, ultimately leads, leads to domestic instability. This, will, this, is, this also leads to a restructuring of the economy. In the West, what has happened is, 
they cannot produce mass produce items anymore uh, economically okay because they are urbanized they neither have surplus labor nor do they have really green fields america does have green fields america in fact has virgin river basins where nobody stays at all places like maine and all which is where american corporates are investing in highly energy intensive automated processes high end the high end capital goods and things like that so when it became clear to the to the americans and to the west that they could no longer run an industrial economy where they will produce all the components and all the you know smaller parts themselves they hit upon this grand strategy of globalization this globalization 2. Point, uh, maybe 3.0 because globalization 1.0 is basically the british you know the spanish empire actually the spanish habsburgs are maybe uh, 1.0 the british are 2.0 the dutch and the british and the american the 3.0 also called colonization actually in other words so what they have done is this is not very different from what the british did ultimately by the 1920s the british uh, industrial revolution had also sputtered out they had become highly urbanized by 1920 itself they if if india was not there and if other african colonies was not there they would not have been able to fight the germans because the germans were in, getting into the heyday of their industrialization then and in, and in world war 2 they would have lost anyway without america industrializing and the soviets industrializing so they would not have won world war 2 at all in fact they didn't win world war 2 world war 2 was won by the soviet union fighting on land and america fighting on the atlantic that is what ultimately led to the and that is how the world order also shaped itself after world war 2 because the victors became the two superpowers etc now what happened was the america the america northeast had already gone through the gone through that british process because they were also early industrialized don't forget in the american union war in the union civil war the north ultimately won because of superior armaments capability okay the south had slaves the south had people to throw but the north was industrialized so the north basically outbuilt the south but that also meant that by the by around say 1920 the great depression era the north had gone through this nexus problem it had become fully urbanized and its units were no longer viable you know units were not viable industrialization and food was no longer there either you see when you urbanize you it also means that a your countryside has become uh, has shrunk okay the number of the arable land that you have has shrunk because arable land is not everywhere arable land is along the river only so if you start building houses everywhere arable land will shrink and on top of that you have also lost the skills uh, inherent in farming because you move people from the farm to the city and not only that you don't even have enough people to farm out there see all this talk of agricultural robots modi goes to australia and he visits some university where they see agro robots and all that why agro robots because it has it is now understood that mechanization and energy cannot substitute you know the, 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 either the knowledge or the effort of the farmer it just cannot so now you are looking in agro robots to see if that can be an end but i believe me the technology is many far years away i have actually been involved in a few things like this with our chambers of commerce and all and there is no real scope for agro robots any time in the future it's again it will only end up reinforcing the energy side of the food nexus because those robots will run on energy they will require uh, you know and they won't be able to get energy in situ there are models also where you know you have robots that can eat off the land they they basically eat uh, agricultural produce and but that uh, conversion ratio is not you know not efficacious at all ultimately it's about conversion ratio you put in some input you get some output in the case of most coal plants is 35 37% you know that's uh, that's how much you get so you're losing uh, energy wise calorie wise you're basically putting in more and getting less anyway but that's another matter the uh, the, the real problem here is that by 1970 by 1930 america's northeast had completely gone down that road and then you had only a series of bubbles you will find that the great depression is preceded by both, both the stock market crash and also housing bubbles a series of housing bubbles why do housing bubbles happen it's very simple the political economy moves in that direction you see once there is no more industry that can happen the political economy for employment generation goes towards uh, real estate and real estate is very nice for the banking system also because it allows them to draw rent out of the economy it's like this the ever since the 
ever since the paper money economics came into place with central banking and fractional reserve banking, money is not created by governments anymore. Money is created by the banking system. And money is created when you ask for a loan. That is when money is created. That is the point at which money creation begins by somebody opening an account with a bank, which is actually a loan by the bank. So, so now what has happened is that the bank can lend to promoters to build something. Okay, then the bank will lend to a consumer to buy something from the promoter in the form of, you know, a loan. Then the EMIs will be paid for by that apartment being put on rent by the person who's taken the loan. How many people, act, how, just look at the share of homeless and homeowners in an economic. You'll find that the same people own maybe multiple homes. And those homes are mostly put on rent. Subject to that great day when they will have a windfall gain or something. So you had you will so as long as your population grows even appreciably you can go on arbitraging debt because the, it's not a question of demand really it's a question of turning over debt. I have two sons my debt gets splintered into two sons in the next period. You know that is how that is how we turn over. If I stop having two sons the debt complete debt liability is fully on me if I don't have those sons at all. So this is how I move debt around and this is why population growth is so important. Not really because it creates more demand. It actually helps you turn over debt. So anyway, so and then just before World War II, America then engaged in industrializing the South. The great Roosevelt program, the uh, you know, the great uh, program of getting out of the Great Depression was industrializing the South of America, which was completely rural at that time. What is called Dixie. So that is when the Tennessee Valley Authority was set up. And do note one thing, whether it be the Tennessee Valley Authority or a number of other things that happened in the run-up to World War II, were all publicly owned enterprises. And also you had Ford who shifted from making, you know, uh, cars to making P-50, uh, to making, uh, uh, you know, uh, piston engine uh, fighter planes because the government was underwriting the whole uh, transition yeah. because it was buying. So government spending skyrocketed in the in the run up to World War II and during World War II, and that is when the southern parts were industrialized. That was the get out of jail card to turn over rate of return, which was uh, decaying everywhere. But that uh, get out of jail card had already gone, uh, had been lost by 1970. By 1970, it was clear that the South was also industrialized, California was also industrialized, Northeast was also, and now post-industrial. Okay, you will find that 80% of America's population by 1970 was living in the urban centers by then. And that is the time when the great OPEC crisis happened. And that is the time when the Nixon job happened, when the dollar was dealing from gold and was a free float. So There's nothing better than this. You had, you had countries in the eastern, you would know one thing, that all the East Asian countries, which were used for, uh, you know, turning over capital, by America in that period between 1960 to 2010 were all dictatorships to begin with. None of them were democracies. South Korea was not a democracy. Taiwan was not a democracy. Japan, you can call it a democracy, but we all know that it wasn't really a democracy. You know, you had, Japan was a one-party state for 50 years almost. Where the same party used to win elections. So none of them were democracies. They were all autocracies of various, uh, various degrees. And the biggest autocracy of all was China, the big autocracy, which needed a get out of jail card because of the problems with Mao's great, uh, you know, great leap forward, which had created massive discontent in China and also, as we know, a series of very real problems. That is when they came into a pact with China. The pact was very simple. We will move all our dirty industries, especially the component chain, overseas to your territory. Okay, you have a lot of surplus labor in the countryside. You need to generate employment. You have to show development. See, because of this Western model, every politician in the world has to show development. Everybody. Whether they are elected or not, they must show development. Development is the main mantra today. Where it will lead to is another question. So they moved all those things over there. Then and, and they didn't move it by putting a carbon tax or something. They moved it by putting in laws. Laws which said, that within so much, uh, within this uh, radius of the city, you simply cannot have a unit. This is how they moved away stuff from America. But they, but they made a very clever move of it. What they did was, while the East Asians built all the components and supply chain and everything, America used that time to clean up its environment, its urban environment and other things, while China polluted itself 
America made its streets cleaner, nicer, broader. You see, look at the propaganda involved. When you see an American film, you only see the best parts of their city. And you also see things as they are now. Even if they have a retro film, if they make a film set in 1928, they will, the, the set will look as if, you know, it's completely manicured, which is nonsense. If you see the New York of 1930, you will understand what urban squalor and poverty is, right in the shadow of the Empire State Building. You know, th those images are never shown to people. Even now, if you go to the Bronx or something, you will see how dirty uh, those places are. And now more so, because people are becoming homeless after Fred uh, Freddie May, uh, Mac and Fanny may have collapsed. So you have that situation there, and you they will, show, they will broadcast this. So you, what they do now is, Apple builds, its, builds the iPad in Foxconn. Foxconn uses China's water, China's electricity, using coal for, coal from Australia to power that electricity uh, you uh, star uh, uh, laborers who cannot be unionized okay and minerals all the minerals that go into I, into the iPad okay from that uh, the, either they mine, mine in inner Mongolia and many other minerals from the Pacific Rim countries but 53 percent of the value of the iPad goes back to Apple USA Okay. And this is the great globalization and your papers will play up the fact that China is producing the iPad. See, producing the iPad may not be the best idea always because it entails the reinforcing the energy food water nexus. It may actually be better to invent the iPad and keep the IP with yourself. Especially if you have moved, <laughs> if you have already transitioned into 80% urbanization. Okay, America since 1970 also started doing another thing. It started conserving its own hydrocarbon resources. Till 1973-71, the United States was number one in oil production and the Soviet Union was number two. Okay, this was the world order. They were basically feeding a lot of industries using oil drilled from their own territory. How much time do I have? Have I exceeded that? <laughs> yeah, you have time. Okay, sorry, I'll wrap this up. So, now they, now they move that out of there. And uh, in, by, by the 70s, they started capping oil fields in Texas and other places. And they started, and they became reliant on apparently Middle Eastern energy. Okay, they became reliant on Middle Eastern energy. They also made their uh, refineries. Their refineries were optimized for the kind of crude, both the kind of crude that came from Iran, a sour kind of crude with more sulfur con content, and the crude that comes from Saudi Arabia which now accounts for only 15% of the total crude that goes to America. But all the while, they were sitting on technology that would enable them to tap unconventional hydrocarbons. And all the while, they, were, they are not just sitting on, the, on shale gas and shale oil kerogens, they are also sitting on some of the world's best conventional oil fields. So they have moved everything, all the dirty industries away. Their places are urbanized. They have many river basins which are untouched in Maine and other places. They have resources of all kinds. They have fresh water, they have oil, they have uranium. Okay, whereas China in the name of development has completely ruined its eastern seaboard. Its eastern seaboard is completely ruined. See, when you talk about China, when we always look at China, a country which is three times the size of India, that's not the China really. The China is basically the four river basins on the eastern coast, especially the Wangho, Yangtze, Kang, Pearl, Z River. This is the China that is China really. Well, now what has happened is because of this uh, Deng Xiaoping and Mao Zedong's policies of ramp rapid industrialization, the Wangho River doesn't reach the eastern sea anymore. It doesn't reach the eastern sea. All the water has been diverted. The Chinese have actually killed off their mother. The Han, the mother, the Wangho is called the mother of the Han. And the Han have killed off their mother already. So what does this mean? But are they going to do nothing about it? No, they're going to do something about it. They're going to try and steal uh, Tibet's water. They're going to steal Tibet's water and Tibet's resources. They are not interested in settling uh, Han in Tibet. That is just a fanciful uh, thought that many Indian analysts have. That, you know, they build a rail line to get Han into Tibet is all bullshit. The rail line has been built to use Tibet as a resource colony. And they are also conducting very funny experiments along the Yalung Zangpo bend, where they want to divert water into what into their $65 billion north-south river basin transfer plan, in the inter-river basin transfer plan. 
and that plan is not going to work without stealing the waters of the uh, you know of the brahmaputra because the even the basins which are south of the huangho and yangtze kiang even they don't have enough water they have a complete g2 kind of a compact with america right at the moment american business and chinese business are tied at the hip via the dollar you see what happens is when america moved away all this stuff abroad what it also did was it has let the dollar appreciate over the years you would remember in 1960 the rupee was 4 rupees was a dollar today 60 rupees is a dollar so all talk of you know currency not being you are not being currency depreciation is required for comp- competing for who not for america because that is not america's model even if america wants to compete with you on various things it doesn't have the green field to build anything not does it have the labor it can com- it does have all the high tech industries especially the military aerospace industries but in those military aerospace industries it has played a very clever game it has created a globalized supply chain so the components are all being built elsewhere whether it is putting together a system as a high value item and then selling it to you at a huge cost you know that is the that is the game they are playing which is why whenever you test an agni or you try, you, you know you try to uh, boost drdo's budget they start talking about how poor india is etc because their entire game is leveraging ip and military power you see that is the game they know if all of you start moving up the value chain and you are, your economy has not urbanized you still have a strong agricultural sector then you don't really need them Why, why is it that you are uh, engaging in trade with them? Not because of competitive advantage. You are engaging in trade with them because they have opened you their market, for which they are paying you in dollars. You, they are making everybody compete for dollars like this. See, everybody is competing with everybody else for dollars. America doesn't have to compete for dollars because it is printing dollars away to glory, and those dollars are getting recycled back into America's system. So America doesn't. America, if you think about America facing hyperinflation because of quantitative easing, it will not happen. America will face hyperinflation only the day it cannot import food. That is the day it will face hyperinflation. It will not face hyperinflation because of that. Because if you look at America's curve, it's like this: food imports have been rising like this, and food export, uh, food production has been plateauing like this. because america is now feeling the heat in that whole mechanized agriculture why do you think they give such huge subsidies why are they not willing to relent on wto subsidies they are not willing to relent because the land is poisoned they cannot produce food competitively anymore and very soon they won't be able to produce food in absolute terms today and europe and now let us come to europe what has happened to europe europe is finished it is you are seeing the dinuma of europe it will become very obvious very soon it is obvious to a spaniard it is obvious to a portuguese it is obvious to an italian it is obvious to an irish man and it is a, it is just not that obvious to a german right now but very soon it will be obvious to a german also see what europe has done is europe hasn't been able to preserve its resources it has even ended up using north sea gas and everything else it has not been able to uh, sustain itself in all the high end industries germany has been to an extent machine tools and other precision engineering industries but in many things it has not been able to stay with the uh, compete with america or japan it doesn't have resources it is fully urbanized it cannot feed itself apart from france every west european country is a net calorie importer in the case of the great united kingdom net calorie import is 65% even if britain wants to feed itself it will not be able to do anything about it okay so and and america's america's triumph will be to destroy europe even quicker america if europe is destroyed even quicker then america will occupy the high end space even longer you know that high end the high tech industry space where where europe is its nearest competitor so he, so america is the interest doesn't lie in supporting europe against china russia actually russia is its competitor because russia has the same kind of economic structure now America is also now becoming a net expo- exporter of resources. American gas is going to come to Indian shores in 2017. American coal is already being exported to India. Okay, Russia is also doing the same thing, and both of them have these high-end military industries, which also feed into technologies that can help you extract resources more easily. So the future of the world is like this now. 
There is America which will export resources. There is America which will continue to invest heavily into research and development, whatever they have. They will try to keep a strong dollar because they need to buy things with the dollar. They will not depreciate the dollar and try to export or something. That is not going to happen. They will generate more employment through shale gas and shale oil than they will by producing clothes, you know. So they are not going to go down and they can't produce clothes anyway. Where will they produce clothes? Mail. Russia, same situation. Russia also is a resource heavy economy. In fact, it's a petrol state. It needs a certain, you know, price of the oil to balance its budget. And you have China, which is now industrialized, but needs to get rid of industry, wants to send some of that industry to India, but wants to send it on its own terms with a fixed rate of return. That is why this whole Modi Z summit did not work. Because we are not willing to give them a rate of return which can which is which is acceptable to them. They will need to let the yuan appreciate because they also have to buy food now. China's agriculture sector is getting into problems. So where does that leave us, given that we are going to do make in India? See, we have to do make in India anyway. Okay, we have to create that industrial sector because that is how value is turned over. The value multiplier in industry continues to be 1.5. In fact, this whole notion of growth and prosperity and having purchasing power comes from the value multiplied in industry. Okay, but we have to understand that we should not end up destroying agriculture, trying to do make in India. Agriculture needs a new wave in India. And also this whole urbanization, the smart city, I am very happy that smart cities, they are now talking about upgrading old cities into smart cities. New smart cities are, are not an idea at all. What we need is 10,000 smart villages. What we need is smart villages to surround smart cities. Smart and, and villages should also become sites of innovation and growth. This is a, seems like a tall order because of the governance system in our country. But this is where we have to head. We cannot fall into this 80% urbanization trap. We will destroy ourselves through demand failure and unemployment very quickly. Even quicker than America has. Because they have done it before, we are doing it later. So we have to focus on new agriculture. And that is where the research of the West is also focusing. The West is showing its clean streets and its ivory towers to draw the best minds out of India. To make them now work on India's problems. Earlier they used to work on, you know, things like iPads and all. But now they are working on energy, food and water. So instead of people running away over there, they might as well work on that right here. You know, they have to, we have to send directed technical change into energy, food and water. And we have to start an uh, association with Africa because the West is getting back in there. The West wants to steal Africa's uh, food, essentially. And that is the situation we have. So all this talk of, you know, an alliance of democracies in, the, uh, in, the, in, in East Asia, all that is fine. The only country we need is actually Australia. That is the country we really need because it has the resources. We don't need America and honestly, Japan also. We need Japan only to a degree. Because Japan, Japan's uh, advantages also are in the old industries, like automobiles and other things. They do have a lot of advantages in material sciences, but they're not willing to share that with us. It's not like they're waiting to give away that IP to us. So we have to focus on creating IP inside India. That is where our trust should be, on winning the strategy of technology. That is where the war will be for IP and jobs. That is the war of tomorrow. All other wars are merely dynamic, where you're pushing and pulling. Nothing else. So we should not fall prey to this American pivot to Asia or something. America and China are more with each other than we are with either of them. I can assure you of this much. <laughs> they, are, they are tied at the hip. India is not. India has to think Swadeshi ultimately. But in a, in a more, in a clever sort of way. So this nexus is understood. Anyway, I'll keep it there. Thank you, Saurabh, for a very interesting talk. You rightly pointed out a major issue, which is the agrarian issue in the, in the world. You rightly pointed out that America is going to face the problem only when it fails to solve, to import food to feed its people. And that's also to be all, we have all seen in the movies and in the TV series, when you watch about the Roman Empire, we see that the great Roman emperors are trying to feed their people, to distribute free, free grains and all. And you must be wondering why this great city which sent which sends army to the world to conquer it is unable to feed its own people. I think that becomes somewhat clear to us after listening to this nexus between food, energy, and water. So I now throw the floor open for the questions. Uh, please be brief and please identify yourself before asking the question. Thank you. Hello, 
Thompson. I am Bhavan Chaudhary from the uh, Center for Political Studies, School of Social Science. Sir, I have two questions to ask. Uh, the first is about you. You, to, uh, you were talking about uh, dollar dollar issue. So my question to you is that uh, with respect to the concept of BRICS in New Development Bank and the use of their own currencies for their business. So how far will this idea go in putting up a jolt to the you know kind of uh, hegemony of uh, dollar? First thing and second point. Uh, as you were discussing about agriculture and so many prospects, uh, my point is that how far, how viable would be the river linkages? Like you have mentioned about how destructive it was, kind of it was in Nile, but uh, but according to newspaper reports and kind of, this seems to be a very ambitious idea of a drink linkaging of rivers. Uh, uh, earlier, earlier in India, first it was it was a project, but that couldn't have been completed unfortunately. So will it, will this so help? If not complete, but at least partially solve the India's problem because you have uh, you have some places you in the same country uh, at same time simultaneously you have some areas which are drought which we which we have drought in some areas we have flood. So will it help in solving the problem? Thank you. Yeah, I'll answer the first question. The second question first. These are obviously the really pertinent questions of today. And the first, the I we were linking will not solve anything. It will only increase problems. Okay, you cannot, there's no such thing as a surplus basin as a deficit basin. If some basin is deficit, then naturally it is deficit. You cannot make it surplus by pushing in water. How are you going to link the river through canals that will end in irrigation, seepage, uh, evaporation and seepage? How, and uh, you're going to do it at a huge energy cost also because you will have to create these dams, pumping stations, etc. Not to mention that the ecosystem of each river is very different. The pH values are different. The species in each river are different. What is the point of, you are not talking about uh, homogeneous systems, you see. Water from the Ganga is not the same as water from the Godavari. The water catchment area of the Ganga is not the same as the catchment area of the Godavari. So obviously you are not going to link that anyway. They are talking about linking two tributaries of the same river like Ket, uh, Ken and Betwa. Even that is fraught with problems because even tributaries are dissimilar. You will have to submerge forest land to link uh, those rivers. It's not worth it. See, w why is it that the Gurjara Pratihara empire could uh, sustain for 400 years? They used step wells. This was a very big empire. And in, if you go to Gujarat and Rajasthan, you will find that those, in those arid areas, they conserve water in situ, which is what we should do. We should harvest water in situ instead of trying to provide water from some so-called surplus area. Tomorrow, if your Himalayan glaciers start uh, you know, melting at a faster rate, then your northern basins will become surplus only for a while. There will be massive flooding and then both will become deficit. Okay, Because you are losing the water into the ocean all the time. It's not like the water is conserved anywhere of the river. The oceans have been filled by ice melting in the, on land. That is how the oceans were filled. So you, you are just draining water in there. So I am not, and I honestly, I think the moment they try this Kane Betwa link, they will understand how infeasible this idea is. Same with this high speed railway also. The only high speed railway likely to be built will be this Ahmedabad uh, Mumbai railway, nothing more than that. The first question about the dollar. The dollar is a very peculiar thing. You see, some people, what if China dumps the dollar? China cannot dump the dollar. If you, China's dollars or anybody's dollars are mostly invested in treasury bills, American treasury bills, which can be purchased only with dollars. American treasury bills can be bought only with dollars. American treasury bills can be sold only in dollars. So suppose China tries to dump those treasury bills, move out of them, it'll have to sell them to somebody, right? That will generate demand for the dollar. You see, you cannot get out the dollar like that. What you can do is, over time, you cannot invest in the treasury bills and use the dollar while it still has uh, universal acceptability to buy up resources. Because the most valuable, three most valuable resources in this world are topsoil, fresh water and plutonium. These are the three most important things. Everything else is subsidiary at the end of the day. These are the three most valuable resources and you will find whether it is corporates or whether it is uh, big uh, major <coughs> powers of the world, they are interested in these three things. Today you have Reliance and everybody talking about contract farming. Why? Because the terms of trade for food is rising all the time. Why, why would you make a tractor when you can sell wheat at 2000 rupees a kg? <laughs> that is the day we are going to see if things go on like this. So, and the problem is also not of, uh, so you can't move out of the dollar like that. 
you can move out of the dollar by using the dollar to buy things and reducing your dollar exposure over time. And then, and also ensuring that the dollar exposure doesn't increase by trading with your main partners in bilateral currencies. Okay, but this is a very gradual process. And China doesn't want to do it quickly because it is getting a lot out of America. You will find that China has now left our side in the basic group of countries and has committed to 2030 as the peaking, peaking year for their emissions. You know, the secretly negotiated agreement between Obama and uh, Xi Jinping, which was announced on the side just before the G20 summit in Brisbane. What, what is it about? It says that America will reduce its emissions by a quarter from 2005 levels by the year 2030 and, America and China will peak emissions at 2030. Okay, they have cut a deal on the side. So China is making some binding commitments. China obviously wants to burnish its brand in this climate change uh, politics and everything. And also it's an admission that China cannot grow beyond 2030, okay? <laughs> that is also an admission there because growth is ultimately hydrocarbon growth. So, so, this, uh, so our friends over here, they are not going to short the dollar. There is going to be no war between China and America of any sort because of the simple reason that both America and China have levers on each other. Why do you think uh, China is investing in anti-ship ballistic missile technology and America is investing in new UCAVs which can fly over of its aircraft carriers from say 3000 kilometers away? It's simple. You see, you can't go nuclear. But so you must have a conventional detonant where America will say, I will burn your cities conventionally. China will say, we'll try to prevent that by creating, you know, losses to American to the American Navy conventionally. Barring which, China will say, I will go nuclear. So that is the nuclear conventional fire break. But nobody will go nuclear. Okay. But this is all pushing and pulling. But China cannot be hemmed in unless and until India is also on America's side. And that will be very stupid for India to do. India must deal with China on its own. And because America is not going to. America is only going to try and use us as a bargaining chip. Just like China is using us as a bargaining chip against America. That is the, that is the whole thing. Earlier it was easier. The Soviet Union was there. So putting pressure on China was very easy. But now Russia is also dependent on China to various degrees. So uh, we, we won't have that. Thank you, sir, for your uh, very important and exotic uh, you know, value which you brought to this discourse. Uh, uh, related to agriculture sector uh, about which you talk, uh, one of the most fertile uh, and most populated land area uh, in this uh, world is Indo-Gangetic Plain, and which depends upon the Ganga River Basin system. Now, I was talking to someone uh, who, who is working uh, uh, on Ganga Isu, uh, and he said that one of the way of revolution, revolutionizing this whole discourse would be like uh, this demolish. Uh, dam project. Uh, you know, you uh, right now just talked about about the associated uh, defects uh, effects uh, uh, of uh, this da damming system. So, do you think that uh, uh, to frame this debate, we should also bring in a socio-cultural aspect uh, of the Ganga, which also translates into socio-economic benefits? But uh, because of the kind of pseudoscience we have been practicing in this country, whereby we thought that. Uh, uh, that by uh, you know uh, by uh, using river water uh, we are kind of uh, uh, bringing people out of their poverty uh, at the same time uh, uh, disturbing the the ecosystem in which they were inhabiting for thousands of years so 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 I think that people like you uh, need to amplify your voice on various platforms so that people who really matter in policy making can hear so you take him there. You raised a, again a very important point, and that's precisely the thing that a lot of things have stayed in harmony with traditional systems and which have also which were updated over time and they lived in harmony. And you have, but you did not have explosive growth, you see, you did not have explosive development, you did not have so many things. That is the whole uh, con that the modern world has sold. You, you could have lived in that harmony earlier also, but your population would have been would have had to be much lower. And you would have had to not have had so many things. See, see you, because you are attaching so much intrinsic value.
to so called modern amenity is that this form is continuing and is being reinforced it is being reinforced by advertising the political process is reinforcing it and you ask any villager he will say his idea of development is to live in a concrete house and not in a mud hut whereas you know a mud hut is maybe more sustainable a mud hut could have also been upgraded with modern amenities if you had direct technical change in that sense but nobody wants to do that so that is the that is that is the crux of the problem and now as far as the tehdi hydro uh, thdc is concerned you see thdc taking out thdc would mean taking out the northern grid okay because what is that? this is how development why it's such a double edged sword thdc is a very important peaking scheme one of the few ways in which an electrical grid in today can store power is not batteries because battery technology is nothing today really whether it be anything lithium ion or whatever it doesn't matter the main way is water Water is the main way in which electrical grids store power today, especially in these reservoirs, these pump storage plants. This Tehri is not a run of the river plant; it is a reservoir-based project. Okay, so these reservoir-based projects are the main way of storing electricity today. And this Tehri, which which is thousand megawatt one unit, is actually very important for stabilizing the northern grid during peak hours. So if you take it down, you must be ready with an alternative peaking scheme. I am never in favor of these hydropower projects beyond a few. I have never been in favor because I can see they have created trouble everywhere in Brazil, in America, in India, everywhere. And their attraction is also well understood. Their attraction is that energy return on energy invested. It's only the concrete, all the energy that has gone into making the concrete and other things, whereas the nature takes care of generating the power by just moving elevation levels on the river. Well, you know, I have. Uh, I gave a talk of this sort. I gave at TED also TEDx. Plan to give more talks. I, I, I went to Russia recently for this circular economy uh, for this innovation forum. Is Modi listening? Yeah, I look. I don't know if Modi is listening or not. Modi, Modi, Modi. I don't. I don't know what it will take for Modi to listen to this kind of thing. I can keep saying it. I I write about this also. In fact, I am now engaged in research in this area. Analytical research in this area also, but uh, at the end of the day, we, uh, politics in India has to be cleverer. You know, we have to we have to then look at then we have to look at the political uh, process itself. Because ultimately, when you run a party, you have to give chai to ten people and you have to get jobs for them. That's what happens when you run a party. So how are you going to run that and yet get these policies implemented? <laughs> that is. Uh, That is a very difficult question. See, Modi has to look at Modi has to deal with Obama. You see, so he has he has a lot of things on his plate. Hi, good afternoon. First of all, thank you for your presentation. I have uh, two or three questions. Uh, first, with respect to the agricultural policy. Um, so the food regime has basically been divided into like neoliberal policy or just supply based, like production in America is engaged in this. European style of multi-function policy, monopoly on nutrition, and all that. And now with this development of food clusters, mega food parks, and what do you, what do you look at? How do you look at food clusters in India? Like balancing between industrial and non-industrial sector, and then industrial sector, and how do you look at that? Second question is, I'm an MPhil student with the Japanese studies program, so I'm reading a lot about methane hydrates and this and all mm-hmm. of that. So what is your how and will that be another shape that we should look at and what we should be looking at? And uh, yeah, these two questions. Okay, the first question, second question first again. See, methane clatrates, basically methane clatrate, gas hydrates, huh, is uh, uh, fire ice, which is uh, essentially uh, you know a gas trapped in these pure crystals at the seabed. Essentially, CH four methane only, natural gas. Now, the thing is that this has been another of those things that will suddenly come out on the world. Now, the Japanese are world leaders in this. The Americans are not far behind. Till ten uh, years ago, we used to have a very active program on this ourselves. But uh, this was another of the UPA's gifts to India, you know, <laughs> when they slowed down this program. And uh, the if the Japanese have actually made any breakthroughs, they are not going to share it with us for the love of God. I can assure you of this much. If only we are also capable enough that they will participate with us. There are joint programs going on with the Japanese and with the Americans in this. And every year, it seems that the Japanese are about to announce a major breakthrough on gas hydrates. The Russians are also interested, but it hasn't happened yet. But it may happen. Nothing is impossible. The potential is huge. But the thing is, at what cost? 
You see, when you when you do growth, when you talk about economic growth, you are talking about relative prices, not absolute availability. The reason why I talk about this nexus is most of the sustainability literature and sustainability analysis focuses on absolute availability. Absolute focuses on absolute availability. Absolute availability is not the issue. Far before you actually run out of everything, you will run out of growth because of the relative prices pushing you from below and employment being destroyed all the time for a number of reasons, especially the uh, reinforcement of the energy food water nexus. So at what cost will they get gas hydrates will matter. And then, the, then the first question coming to the first part about this whole issue of uh, what model, whether it be the Europeans, whether it be the Americans, whether it be the Japanese, Japanese are by the way the worst of the world. 65% of their calories are also imported. The worst is South Korea, the great miracle of the Han River. 90% of food calories imported. Check out on the internet, you will find how much concern there is in South Korea about this now. Okay, so yeah, South Korea may have become an industrial tiger, but it doesn't have food. It's trying to colonize Mongolia right now. In fact, the Japanese are also getting in there. So now what has happened is, whether it be these, any of these guys, it doesn't matter what their distributive model is. They have different notions of distributive justice. Even in America, you have 55 million people on food stamps. They get food stamps, they go and buy it from, you know, uh, mac cheese and everything. And everywhere you will find there is this thing that let us move into food processing. So much food is being wasted, food processing is the way forward. To an extent only. Food processing was great because food processing allowed single mothers to work in America. That was how food processing penetrated American markets. After World War II, once the women had already come out into the economy, the men could not stuff them back into the households again. They were working and they had to work. They had a professional life. But professional life entailed time, uh, time costs. You know, To meet those time costs, that is when the microwave and the food revolution happened in America, the food processing revolution. Today, this revolution is no longer a revolution. It is a situation where... They use more calories to process a gram of food than they actually keep in the retain in the gram of food. So you are so thermodynamically, this is not a viable process ultimately. See, so there's net calorie loss. How have they how are they managing net calorie loss? You will just look at the imports from India and China. All sorts of meat intermediates they're importing from us. Why meat intermediates from us? Very good idea. One ton of beef requires 15 times more water than one ton of rice to process. Why will America process the beef in America? They will outsource it to you. And three of your people will get employed and somebody will say this is progress. You know, so that, is, <laughs> that is how the whole thing is. So main thing is, Europe in Europe, only France is still a calorie sufficient country. Only France. Okay, and it has about 11-12% in the countryside, but it is also facing huge problems. And, and companies like Kraft and all, they are not liked by uh, ordinary farmers at all. Because they, they are, they are, they, they, and, and, and in Europe what is happening is, the government is increasingly intervening to keep those farmers in business. So government debt is just spiraling. Government debt will spiral. When you have this nexus, government debt will spiral. People will lose jobs. Thing, the cost of things will increase, the government will give freebies. You know, they, they get rid of chemical, get rid of fertilizer subsidy, somebody saying. Ah, get rid of it now. You see, it's not the farmer you are subsidizing. That's nonsense. That's the typical neoliberal way of thinking. That the farmer is being subsidized by fertilizer subsidies. You are being subsidized. Your food will become unaffordably expensive if those fertilizer subsidies are not given. If that diesel subsidy was not given all these years, your rice would have been at 200 rupees a kg a long time ago. So it's all skewed. The entire the way in which economics is studied, economics is taught, everything is skewed towards, uh, you know, what, what should I say? Towards uh, apparent comparative advantage. Okay, but not towards sustainability. That is the problem. And go ahead. I'm getting what's next is this year in the Bonn conference just two years back and I think right. But the concept of sustainability has been there centuries ago. What triggered this? Was it after the financial crisis or before all this? Right now, what is this? In my case, what has triggered is my journeys through India and then also journeys to Europe. Uh, uh, Europe and I also travel through Europe actually extensively. And the Europe I saw is a Europe which is very different from the Europe people see. In when I was going to when I was in this uh, metro station in Milan. You know, this overhead, uh, 
this uh, the grill, the vent grill fell in front of me, and a huge amount of water poured out. I mean, it would have cleaved my head. So it was another thing. It was clear to me they are not be able to sustain their systems anymore. You see, you can build a ten super expressways, but uh, can you pay for those expressways in two hundred years? You you want to build high speed railway on the same uh, uh, route where you have three airlines which are already struggling. Now you expect me to believe they'll be profitable? Either of those, nothing will be profitable. All this is just one way of making sure that while there is a stock of money out there, that stock of money comes to a few people, so that if one percent of the population ends up owning ninety nine percent of wealth, and that and they will translate that into real wealth. They will buy up land. They will buy up resources. You know, today if uh, say somebody like uh, Ambani, if he wants to say goodbye to the world, he probably can. He has that antilla. Okay, I'm sure it has an intake channel access to the sea. Okay, he can put a nice uh, mini nuke in there, and he will desalinate the water from there. He will use vertical farming to grow enough food for himself, <laughs> and he will and he will pay. He will use while money still has value. He will get robots who will look just like you to work for him. <laughs> you know, so so the thing is that, that is the the whole point is that that. Money by itself is nothing but a debt-creating instrument. Money says, "I have promised to pay the bearer sum of so and so rupees." Okay, this is what the money says. It is okay. This is what the money says. It says, "I owe you." The real thing is energy, food, and water. And energy keeping control of energy, food, and water is basically what military might is about in today's world. That is what is happening everywhere. Why? Why are we having problems in Central India? Why do we have a Maoist problem in Central India and other places? You see, because you have you have got to the tribals, you have given them modern medicine, you uh, you increase their numbers, but you can't do anything else with that. You see, what do you want to do? You want to take out the forest and you want to build a plant over there, which won't employ them anyway. So obviously they will resist. But what are they going to do otherwise? They also want in you. Uh, you humiliated them for so many years by saying I am from the city and you are a tribal. You know, you've told them that they, because you don't wear a Nike, you're not civilized. That is what you've told him basically. So why will he not uh, then agitate and take uh, take on these things? The entire discourse has to change towards sustainability. India has sustained for five thousand years. I have a feeling it won't sustain for another hundred years if we go down our current path, which is the Western path, which is the path that China has gone down, and which is the path we should never go down. We should understand that our minds, our technology, should be directed. Of course, see the only the main reason why I am also a defense analyst and a security geek is because I I don't have a woolly-eyed notion of the world. Okay, unless you are able to protect your civilization, you will have no strategic autonomy to do anything, to whether you follow a capitalist path or a socialist path or any path, and that is why you need nuclear weapons also. You know, if you don't have nuclear weapons, then you will be even more subject to global pressures to fiddle with your economy. Which is which will be open up everything, destroy small retail because it only generates forty million uh, employment of for for forty million people. Build large, you know, multi-brand retail, uh, big box retail chains on the outskirts of the city, which will also become uneconomical after a while. Today, Walmart has moved into e-retail. By the way, Walmart is the next big thing that is going to be on this whole e-commerce space. Because Walmart is moving all its processes online, it's more working on a just-in-time model where stuff will come from China, and within that it will get delivered to your doorstep directly from the port. You know, <laughs> so it won't generate any jobs in big box retail either. All these ten million jobs that they are talking, none, nothing of ten million will be generated. Keep retail out, multi-brand retail out of India under any and every circumstances. Do not allow it. And you, with only fifteen hundred or two thousand crores. You can build enough storage for your agricultural sector if you want to, if you have the will. But the question is, you will need energy for those for refrigeration. Where does rural India have energy? But to build the plants for for energy, you will have to take uh, over agricultural land. Nothing is easy. What I'm trying to say is that this whole developmental monster is a very difficult thing. It's a very very difficult thing. It is not nobody has a magic wand of being fixed. The Western countries. One quarter of the population of the world are drawing on three quarter of the world's resources just by printing notes, euro and dollar. The day you stop doing that, which you are doing, stopping to do already to an extent, see what happens to them. It's already happening, 
and you want to emulate them, their model, which has not been able to sustain the Westphalian nation state for even 200 years. 200 years they have not sustained. And you want to emulate them on a scale and we have four times the number of people that America has. What is going to happen to us? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a norm issue really. We should not go down that path at all. This whole development, I want to be rich path. What rich? Nobody is rich. Everybody is dependent on everybody. You have highly indebted rich people. You have highly indebted rich countries. That's all you have. So net out the debt. That's okay. Hello sir, I am Vivek Kumar Shaurav. I am pursuing MP in SIS. My question is regarding global land guard and geopolitics of food security. After 2007 and 8, Abraham Plus has in food sector. Many, com many countries investing in developing countries. Many multinational and transnational companies have started land guard in Africa and Southeast Asia as well. On the name of food security, they produce biofuels and commercial crops. So, what do you think is there a development opportunity for developing country, underdeveloped country, or a new emerging region? See, the, actually, the world is divided only into urbanized countries and urbanizing countries. The reason why they are doing those land grabs in, say, Gabon and other places because they have river basins which are still virgin where they can grow things if they want to. While they grow a lot of, you know, cash crops and energy crops and things like that, they also actually grow a lot of food for themselves and for the global markets. But the way they are growing food is totally that old industrial agriculture. The agenda is simply to suck out all the surplus from the land in a very Marxist kind of way. Okay, they will suck out all the surplus from the land. That is their idea. You will find that there are stories in our papers about how uh, land holding size in India is uneconomical and how it cannot compete with a 53,000 acre farm in Argentina, okay, which is growing strawberries. And they, what they don't say is that 53,000 acre farm in Argentina will be competitive only for 10 or 20 years because the, because the multinational which is farming those 53,000 acres is not interested in keeping it sustainable. It just wants to draw out all the surplus through hardcore chemical farming. Over there, that's what's been done. So, and and even in the case of land holding and uh, lands, you know, uh, this whole question of what is an economic size for a land holding, this is also not an easy question. There, there are cases where the larger land holding may be more profitable. There are even cases where the smaller land holding may be profitable. There are a whole number of factors that go into being. So, what can then uh, so-called what you said developing countries do? They can develop very differently. They should keep focusing on agriculture. And they should focus on moving up the technology value chain. Even Nigeria must build fighter aircraft at some point. Okay, or at least must have the know-how. Because, because the notion that this, because you people have to understand that this, they will just try to lock you into, the West will try to lock people into this poor country, rich country uh, thing. Whereas the fact is you managed to send a probe to Mars. Okay, that is what they have noticed. Because that goes into your brand. It's ultimately about brand positioning. Recently, there's this whole thing about India being number 31 and Germany being one, this global brands report. Obviously, that is what they want. Because as long as their brands are stronger, the best minds will want to go over there. And the minds are the ones which ultimately will solve problems related to energy, food, water, and other things. Who's going to do that? It's, it's intellectual capital that matters the most. So you have to keep your intellectual capital so you maybe... You have to launch uh, government-funded programs. <coughs> government-funded programs are in the last 30 years in many African countries because of, say, loans where the government would offer 50% and the IMF would give a loan or the World Bank, IBIT would give a loan, was to make an airport. Okay, they made a huge airport, say, in a place like Burkina Faso where nobody flies. Okay, so how is the airport going to pay for itself? Obviously, the airport did not pay for itself. And Burkina Faso was then subject to loan conditionalities by the World Bank and IMF. And loan conditionalities meant very simple. You open that oasis you have where I will farm strawberries or buy somebody. Or Monsanto will do some testing over there and destroy your soil. Things like that. So 
So uh, here India can play a role. India can become like the Soviet Union and arm all these African countries to the teeth. If India can arm these African countries to the teeth, you know, we can we can prevent uh, the, this the, whatever neoliberal or whatever you want to call it. It's actually neo-colonial really. This neo-colonial kind of game that has been tried again. The denouma of the West was World War II. World War II, their economies were shattered and broken. America's was not. Okay, Europe's economies were dead. It was Marshall Plan and a lot of other things. And then they're coming together, the ECSC, and creating this euro. Why do you think Ireland is not leaving the euro? Ireland should just be printing its own currency and paying back all its debt. Why isn't it doing that? Because if it does that, Ireland will see an old, a potato famine, a new potato famine. Because Ireland is highly food deficient. And it needs the euro to buy the food. See, euro is what keeps food cheap in all these systems, in all their food systems. So that's the thing. So we have to, uh, we have to show, we have to build linkages with Africa right now on these models and, uh, and try these alter. These, you see, what has happened after the Soviet Union collapse? All the things that I'm saying will fall in the realm of radical economics. You know, that has become a problem now. Uh, you talked about why they are thinking about it. The, they are thinking about it is because now their back is up against the wall. <laughs> that is why they are thinking about it, which is why the nexus between energy, food and water is now becoming not radical and mainstream. But economics is still not here. The people who are in energy, food and water are people like geophysicists, geologists, water experts, hydrologists. These are the guys who are thinking of energy, food and water. But economics is still that old economics, you know. That uh, where there will be a big debate between whether savings creates investment or investment creates savings and whether uh, your prices are sticky or not or whether it is money only which feeds inflation. Supply side inflation doesn't exist. This is the kind of thing. That's where economics has to get its head out of the sand actually. In fact, that is the real test and that economics has to come from the East, from India. It will not come from the West so easily because it doesn't suit them. It doesn't suit them. The economic models that they are teaching you in their textbooks right now have all been developed in a particular context. Ricardo came up with comparative advantage in an England which was not being able to feed itself. It did not have enough corn. Okay. So he told uh, Portugal that, you know, even if you do, you have uh, port wine and you have corn, you export both to me or you gain. Because in relative terms, you might be better off. See, I produce something at using one unit of labor and... Uh, uh, to uh, yeah, commodity A using one unit of labor and commodity B using two units of labor. He produces commodity A using two units of labor and three units of labor for B. But two by three is greater than one by two. So obviously I can trade with him. You know, and we can all gain. Uh, so this this kind of a, this is the theory. All, all the uh, Krugman, for instance, when he came up with his theory of uh, increasing returns of scale and other things, all these things were very, very happening when America was getting rid of all the supply chains from uh, its shore. It was sending into East Asia. That is why all this talk of inter-industry trade, trade in, uh, you know, uh, intermediates, that is when all that literature developed. Now, we have to develop literature on growth sustainability, which is different from theirs, because our perspective is different. So uh, you were talking about uh, the green fields, like uh, why? Why means I want to know, like why? Why do you like? Why did Tata want to grow a plant on uh, a fertile land compared to like you had given another example, mm -hmm. some other place in Rajasthan? Why not a place which is uh, which, which is not that fertile where you can grow crops and and, a, and growing up in a place where it's like. See that uh, if you look at Singhu, well, the first thing is that green water, uh, you know, groundwater is a very important resource. That place in Rajasthan doesn't have enough groundwater. In fact, the marble industry in Rajasthan is always uh, in trouble because of the water situation in Rajasthan. You know, whatever little water they have, they end up using for building marble in places like Makrana and all, cutting, uh, processing marble. So now, in the case of those guys over there in Singhu. You need groundwater for an automobile plant and also for the ancillary units, which also need a lot of water. So where will you get the water from? Second reason was, of course, the fact that it's on NH2, you know. Uh, it's right next to a... So it's easy to evacuate your uh, 
automobiles from there. That was one more reason. But the, but you can't build it anywhere else that easily. See, when you talk about these guys, what have they done in Saudi Arabia and all? Riyadh, most of its water comes via pipeline from a desalination from desalination plants on the coast. The only reason why that is affordable for them is because oil was at $105 a barrel. Yeah. That is why that was affordable. And that is why they want nuclear plants on their coast. Because they want to desalinate using nuclear and keep the oil and gas for international markets. So if you're going to build the plants in the middle of nowhere, then you make water available. But that will make the plant uncompetitive. Because you will then have to build not just the water infrastructure, also you'll have to build the all sorts of supply infrastructure. You know, maybe if you build a very large industrial cluster somewhere, maybe the law, the you know, the economies of scale may work for that. And that is the way things are heading. No more are plants being built on the peripheries of cities and places like that. It's now industrial clusters. But what has to be noted is, uh, although this is very strange coming from me, but if you want these industrial clusters to sustain for 100, 200 years, don't let any urban growth happen around them. Because if you let urban growth happen, they will be choked out very soon. They will not be viable. Real estate. Real estate. Real estate. Real estate. Who's living in these flats? They're worth a crore. Two crores, three crores. Who's going to buy that? Tell me. And you have people living in the street and you're talking about housing. So there's something completely wrong with our priorities. This was the same case with America in the Depression and in 1973, by the way. And uh, and after the OPEC crisis broke. If you see films, you know, see some of Stallone's older films, like Cobra and all. And they will show you homeless people in uh, Harlem and places like that. And then if you see, and then Thatcherite policies that also put a lot of people on the streets. But the point is that the the thing is that this is all the nonsensical. This policy this will only lead to greater and greater inequality. Thomas Piketty and all have already come to inequality, including uh, people like Stiglitz with his price of inequality and Thomas Piketty with capital. But they are still not looking at the main endogenous factor that leads to that inequality, which is the nexus between energy, food, and water which is intrinsic to industrial urbanization and this mode of development. That they're not looking at. They're still thinking in terms of, if we tax the top 10%, we will, you know, reset our economy and it'll start moving. It won't. <coughs> and I don't think it will. Uh, so, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, how do you see the sustainability in the rain harvesting and uh, that connects and how that uh, this uh, policy, neoliberal policy that uh, um, Established. I mean, how do they really manage? How do you can create that thing? The second is the, the on the agri sector. How does technology and IP they can mainly the India is uh, thinking about those country which may help them in the resources. And Israel is one country which is completely you know bullying over this thing is that not the daily or or the defense. It's the agri is the main thing. So how do you see that? How that connects in the agri? This thing, we have to do rainwater harvesting in the cities now. If you look at uh, what is called urban surface runoff, and look at uh, what is called urban surface runoff and things like that, you have you have 15% of, in the, in the case, I had seen a statistic somewhere, where in the case of an agri agricultural field, 15 to maybe 25% of the discharge rainwater used to go into the, uh, into the shallow aquifer. In the urban areas, it's not even 2% because of concretization, asphalting and other things. So we have to build those rainwater harvesting structures now before it becomes too late, you know. Second thing is about as far as uh, people like Chandra Babu Nairu had tried to do this in Hyderabad and one of a few people there when I went visiting, my brother told me that, you know, hey, it has worked. They do have water throughout the year. I don't know about that. But it can be done. Okay, rainwater harvesting can be done. The second part of the thing is about Israel. You're right. Actually, our, our partnership with Israel should focus more on agriculture. But you see, the Israelis are like the Japanese or the Americans. They are also dependent on IP. Why will they give you anything for money? They will not part with technology for money. Nobody parts with the best technology for money. It's stupid to do so. Money is a... What should I say? A non uh, uh, technology is an asset which has a far higher shelf life than money. Money is being eroded all the time through inflation anyway. And the technology, if it is the right kind of technology, especially one that can help with inflation, its value actually increases over time. So why would Israel want to share that with you just like that? 
they have been working with Casri actually jo, for, for a long time. And they have all sorts of technologies in irrigation and sprinkler irrigation because they are a world leader in dry land farming. They are not, they are food sufficient, funnily enough. But then they have to feed only 5 million people. So, ah, they're, they're not like us. So, the thing is that uh, they are food sufficient and they have a lot of technology. But they will not part with those technologies unless our own R&D is also of a very high level in these matters. See, it's like this. If your R&D is very high, then Israel will want to partner with you. First thing that Israel will do, or anybody will do, is the moment you made a breakthrough somewhere, they will offer you the that technology, if they already have it. Because they will tell you, yeah, we know you may, you crossed the threshold, but there's a difference between crossing the threshold and commercializing this. We've already commercialized this, so you just buy us. This is what they do. This is what they do in the arms business also all the time. But there, you know, there, how nationalistic your country is will matter. In some ways, the Chinese have made a lot of mistakes, but they are also very nationalistic. When they decided that this was the path our country had to take, they bench pressed it. So we have to decide what path we want to take as a country, because before you become international, you have to be nationally strong. It's only when India is nationally strong and is creating value for everybody that we will be able to tie in Africa, we will be able to tie in Latin America. Because nobody listens to the weak ultimately. Okay, I'll just make a brief comment. You, you pointed out that two areas we have to focus. One is the technology and one is the economic model. So, uh, regarding the economic model, do you think that we need new teams of study in the Indian history? Like you pointed out Gujarat, Gujarat and Katihara Empire. When we talk about the Vijayanagar Empire, one of the reasons, as you told, that uh, uh, Vijayanagar Empire collapsed because it was unable to sustain yeah. its. Uh, the right should draw. Yeah. The right should draw. Yeah. Even the Mughal Empire, if you see, yes. it was this. There was lots of agrarian unrest and inability to feed its people. Especially yeah. in the richest province of Bengal. Yeah. Even in Awadh and Punjab. Yes, and Awadh and Punjab. So, also. what do you think about this? No, no, absolutely. Instead of you know, instead of spurious debates about whether there were vimanas in the Veda or something like that, all that should be rested at the real contributions of Indian civilization in terms of technology have been in hydrology, okay, in soil maintenance. These are areas where we need to focus heavily. In metallurgy also, but then for some reason, in that thousand year period, from the end of the Gujarat, Gujarat Pratihara Empire, the, unfortunately neither the Sultanate or the Mughals could do enough with it. Vijayanagar did some, but not enough. So, and then the British destroyed our R&D. Okay, they, they made it a point to destroy our they stole whatever they could. And the other thing was low-cost health systems, you know. These are things that we specialized in. Uh, and the, uh, of the many things, rhinoplasty was indeed invented in India. And it was studied in the 18th century by that French man who then took it to Europe. And that is, the first plastic surgeries were conducted after rediscovering rhinoplasty in India, basically. So all those things. So we, our greatest uh, ability was to manage this nexus, this energy, food, water nexus. Wherever we did not manage it too well, the empires collapsed. You know, we've had many empires in India. India has not been only fragmented uh, countries or small kingdoms or anything. It has, there have been pan-Indian empires throughout history. But you will find that none of those empires have made it beyond 200 years. There's Zenith and there's eh, Dinuma and I eh, have 200, maybe the Guptas have made it for 350. Whether it be the Mauryas or the Guptas or the uh, Gujarat Pratiharas or the Sultanate or the Mughals or the British, you know, or Vijayanagar, you are only seeing 200, 300 years of glory, not more than that. So th that is something that we need to really look into because this Republic of India is our latest empire. This is an empire at the end of the day. We have to now look at how we keep make this empire sustainable for more than that 200, 300 year period. And Europe is obviously not a model because they have not sustained for more than 200 years either. Okay, in 200 years their power is crushed and their population is unemployed. Economics is about our employment. Nobody is going to give anybody a freebie. Although that should also be done. That's what the government has to do anyway ultimately. But ultimately it's about gainfully employing people so that they can add value and feel happy about themselves. If you can't employ people and you're just, uh, you because uh, right now you can print a currency which still is being able to buy things. You can go on for a while, but not for long. I, one thing about the Roman Empire also, since we mentioned, you know, the Romans uh, destroyed their water resources. 
they built all these aqueducts to transfer water, which were, uh, which were you know, aqueducts are open. The top is open after all. And that also used to lead to a lot of evaporation. They had, they had other problems. Rome had fountains, you know, hundreds of fountains in Rome and things like that. And all sorts of luxuries, um, uh, saunas, baths, this, that, and they destroyed the hydrology of the place. So it's not surprising that these places have been, uh, you know, ruined. But it's also very interesting that after they have been ruined for a while, something new can be built on top of them, but only after they have been ruined. Which means it's better if they are ruined quicker, quickly enough before they destroy everything, you can build something at that site. But not if they destroy everything. The problem with this industrial age and this new technologies that we have and everything is you can destroy things much quicker. So uh, the old uh, numbers and probably the old metrics are not. See, just look at it. Between the 19th century and the 20th century, what are the things you did? And between the 20th and now, what are the things you have done? You have, there's been an explosion of all sorts of things. Now you are plateauing because the nexus is getting to you. That is why you seem to be plateauing. And you need to, therefore, now you're talking about electric cars and you're talking about how to generate power without emitting. <coughs> there, there's a huge issue there. You see, wind and solar, given that they intermittent power sources, are never going to pay back their energy that goes into making them actually. And somebody will say solar has a payback of six months. Somebody will say energy payback should not be considered for solar PV at all. And things like that. It's not so simple. There is a huge level of energy cannibalism involved. Once you try to penetrate more renewable energy, you will find that you have used a far more energy than you will get back over any acceptable time frame. So your grids will not, uh, and your grids will, there are other costs also of penetrating it. Renewable energy into your grid, cycling and uh, you know cooling costs and many other costs. There are all kinds of costs, but we all talk as if you know there are no costs and there is only growth uh, and development. <laughs> okay, uh, so we end the talk for this week. Thank you, Saru. It was a very 